Hi everybody, welcome to my homestead and welcome to my channel. My name is Jared. In this video, I want to actually go back to the years 2015 and 2016 because uh, before I started doing this thing where we're going year by year looking at all the important quotes, before we started doing this, I already had some quotes from 2015 and 16 and I started with 2018 because that's President Nelson's, uh, that was his first year as president of the church. But really, I think it would be wise to go back and look at 2015 and 16. I don't have anything on here for 2017 at the moment. Uh, that'll change in time, I'm sure. But there were some pretty incredible things said in those years that I think that we would do well to go back and review. Some actually pretty incredible things. Um, so I did the same thing that I've done for 2018, 2019, uh, where I searched the term second coming in the scripture citation index and then added those quotes to here. So here we go. So my very first entry on this spreadsheet is from uh, April 5th. This is the April 2015 general conference. Uh, this is Gerald Cosse, first counselor in the presiding bishopric. And this is what he says. The Book of Mormon describes a period similar to our own that preceded the coming of the Messiah to the Americas. Suddenly, the signs of his birth appeared in the heavens. The people were so stricken with astonishment that they humbled themselves and nearly all were converted. However, only a short four years later, the people began to forget those signs in wonder, uh, in wonders which they had heard and began to be less and less astonished at a sign or a wonder from heaven and began to disbelieve all which they had heard and seen. Uh, this is obviously a warning to us. Uh, there's always people, because of the nature of this channel, where we're specifically watching for signs of the times. Uh, occasionally, someone will come across the channel and, uh, or, or, well, okay, and we'll try and discredit certain things or say, well, that doesn't qualify as the sign. You're looking too too much into it, or whatever the case may be. And it's really sad to see. Um, you know, that's why I have my timeline, the second coming timeline, uh, is to try and keep track of all these significant events. And they are uh, increasing in frequency and in strangeness and in power. And it's, it's just been unbelievable. So you can go, you can check out that spreadsheet, that spreadsheet anytime. Uh, the link for this spreadsheet is in the description below. And you go to the tab, uh, click on these three bars at the bottom, click on the tab called Timeline Second Coming. And this is where I'm attempting to keep track of all the significant events. So let's not be uh, like those people in the in the Book of Mormon who started to disbelieve and be less astonished. Okay, so the next one is from Elder Robert D. Hales of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles, also the April 2015 General Conference. He says, Brothers and sisters, we are responsible to safeguard these sacred freedoms and rights for ourselves in our posterity. What can you and I do? First, we can become informed. Be aware of issues in your community that could have an impact on religious liberty. Uh, I'll admit, I have not done that. Of course, I'm not so sure that's such a big thing here in this small town in Kansas, but that is something that I should keep an eye on, and, and you probably should be too. We've talked about the fact that maybe it would be a good idea uh, for us to be involved, uh, even try and be on the city council or education boards or whatever. Um, I know that it's just like another, <laughs> it's like another responsibility that a lot of us uh, don't feel like we have time for, but maybe pray about it. And uh, maybe the Lord will work things to where you can do that and you can make a difference and stop this tide of just secularism and these crazy agendas that keep getting pushed. Okay, second, in your individual capacity, join with others who share our commitment to religious freedom. Work side by side to protect religious freedom. Third, live your life uh, to be a good example of what you believe in word and deed. How we live our religion is far more important than what we may say about our religion. All right, and then here's the part right here. Our Savior's second coming is drawing near. Remember, this is in 2015. We're almost 10 years past this point 
when he says this. Uh, remember Captain Moroni, who hoisted the title of liberty, inscribed with with the words, uh, in memory of our God, our religion, in freedom, and our peace, our wives, and our children. Let us remember the people's response, uh, exercising their agency. They came running together with a covenant to act. My beloved brothers and sisters, don't walk, run. Run to receive the blessings of agency by following the Holy Ghost and exercising the freedoms God has given us to do his will. So, you know, his talk, it's about religious, religious freedom, but he, he inserts this part about the second coming drawing nearer into not delay. And he's specifically talking about preserving religious freedom. So I can only assume that the reason why you want you would want to hurry before the second coming uh, to preserve religious freedom is because if you don't, then there's going to be a really, really, really dark time uh, where, you know, they're going to win or almost nearly win. And so let's try and make things as good as possible for us until the second coming happens. I, that's what I get out of it. You know, you feel free to put your reasons down in the comments. But OK, next one. There's one from Neil L. Anderson, but I'm going to save that for the end because the name of his talk is Thy Kingdom Come. And it's it's a talk all about the second coming. And I highlighted the parts that seem to be the most significant. And he says some pretty interesting things, but we'll come back. I was kind of rushing to put this video together. I'm talking to Rabbi Gerf, Gerfine in a little bit. Um, so I had, to, I had to kind of hurry, but I'll, I'll add the entire thing here later. Okay, the next one, uh, this is September 26th, 2015. And this is the, um, uh, the general women's session. Okay. Uh, back when the back in the days when they had that separated and it, I don't know why it was like that, but they've obviously restructured it. But the general women's session was in September in this case in 2015. This is a talk by Rosemary M. Wixom, uh, primary general president. The talk is called Discovering the Divinity Within. Elaine Cannon, a former young women general president, said there are two important days in a woman's life. The day she is born and the day she finds out why. We know why. We have come to this earth to help build his kingdom and to prepare for the second coming of his son, Jesus Christ. Very interesting that she's uh, feeling the need in the prompting to remind us of that, the time in which we live, and that in the pre-existence, you weren't just randomly assigned to a dispensation or a period of time You've been specifically, all of us here right now living, have been sent here because the second coming is happening and we have a, a role to play. Okay, the next one is um, President Nelson, but at this time, uh, President uh, Thomas S. Monson is the president of the church, and President Nelson is the president of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles. <clears throat> the name of the talk is A Plea to My Sisters, and now we're in the October uh, 2015 General Conference. He says, and remember, this is now this is the talk that he's repeated. And in fact, during the women's session recently, I can't remember if it was last year, but he essentially brought this very thing back up. So here he's president of the quorum of twelve president of the quorum of the twelve apostles, and then later, when he's president of the church, he brings this up again and makes it the central focus of the women's session. Okay, but this is what he said back then. This has been true in every gospel dispensation since the days of Adam and Eve, yet the women of this dispensation are distinct from the women of any other because this dispensation is distinct from any other. Um, and then in the note, he says, all previous dispensations were limited to a small segment of the world and were terminated by apostasy. In contrast, this dispensation will not be limited in location or time, it will fill the world and merge with the second coming of the Lord. All right, that's the end of the footnote. This distinction brings both privileges and responsibilities. 36 years ago, in 1979, uh, Spencer W. Kimball made a profound prophecy. I should highlight that. 
and President Nelson takes this very seriously, about the impact that covenant-keeping women would have on the future of the Lord's Church. He prophesied, quote, Much of the major growth that is coming to the Church in the last days will come because many of the good women of the world uh, will be drawn to the Church in large numbers. This will happen to the degree that the women of the Church reflect righteousness and articulateness in their lives and to the degree and to the degree that the women of the church are seen as distinct and different in happy ways from the women of the world. And you know the last video that uh, I did, we were talking all about the temple garment. In fact, I did two videos in a row just because uh, surprisingly, I guess it's an issue that everybody has something to say about, um, which I guess is understandable. We're seeing. Um, our morals and standards declining day by day by day. And uh, there's people in the church that are finding a hard time wearing the, the garment appropriately, modifying it or just simply not wearing it when they should. And this could be one of those standards that uh, is something to think about, something that keeps us different from the women of the world um, because it's modest, right? It's modest. But obviously that's not just that's not just it, but that's a part of it. Um, there's probably, I'm sure there's women in the world that do value modesty. And so if you're able to display that and still look good and still be fashionable, but modest, uh, that maybe is attractive to other women of the world, but there's many other things just, you know, talking about religious freedom, for example, or talking about, um, our values and the things that we hold dear, traditional values, uh, family uh, avoiding the garbage entertainment that uh, is consistent, that just constantly pumped out into into every platform, right? So anyway, if you're a woman in the church, uh, I guess I would probably take this very seriously because he's talking specifically about you, and there was a prof a prophecy about you, and uh, look to the people around you and how you can be a good influence on them and potentially bring them into the church. And, uh, you know, we've been doing this Book of Mormon challenge where, let's see, I'll just go to it right now, where a lot of people have had success. And I wonder how many of those have been women. I haven't been keeping track of that, but let's just do it right now really quick. Okay, so Angela Brimhall had a report of a missionary. Daniel, that's one. Betty Horn, two missionaries. That's the second woman. Cambria, two missionaries. Carrie, a missionary. Chris, assuming I'm assuming that that's because I don't think any girls go by Chris with that spelling. Missionary. Uh, Cropperful, I'm not sure. If that's a man or woman, Daniel, missionary. Don is a female missionary. Well, I think. Am I confusing you with Don Ireland? Because I know that. Anyway, I'm a, most likely a uh, female. Diana, missionary, female. DS, not sure. Earnestly waiting, not sure. Grace upon Grace. This is uh, a friend of mine from Vegas, and she is a female. I Lee, that sounds like a female name. Izzy's uh, Equines. I I, I want to say yes, yeah, that that's female. Okay, Jake. Jen Ottens, missionary, female. Joni, female. Uh, Joe Signs, not a female. <laughs> Carlene, female. Uh, K Meek, I'm not sure. Kylon Rice, this is a guy that I don't know if he's still on his deployment, but. Uh, it's a male. Low to go. Oh, wait. Lizzieisms. That's female. M. Not sure. Malai Natui and Mom. Females. Melinda. Female. Melissa. Female. Michael Berry. Male. Nat and Joe Christensen. It's a couple. Pamela Bond and Pamela Rock. Females. Uh, Shirley, female. Spiritual considerations, not sure. S. Sace, not sure. 
Tracy Lee, female, four baptisms, five missionaries, Wade, male, Wayne, Gillespie, male. So I would say that the women are taking it in the Book of Mormon challenge. So I, I, it would seem that there's maybe some empirical evidence here that that is the case. That's actually really inter interesting. Okay. Um, my dear sisters, you who are our vital asso associates during this winding up scene, the day that President Kimball foresaw is today. <clears throat> You're the women he foresaw. Today. 2015. And then this recent general conference, like maybe last year, I think, when he had this repeated. Your virtue, light, love, knowledge, and courage, character, faith, and righteous lives will draw good women of the world, along with their families, to the church in unprecedented numbers. Sorry, I'm deleting some of the <clears throat> footnotes and citations here because uh, I just, like I said, I didn't have time when I originally did this. Okay, now this is, uh, look, this, <laughs> this is interesting. This is from Elder Bednar during the Christmas devotional 2015. And we all know this because this was included in a, a, a popular YouTube video series. And this is where I first heard it. But uh, look what he says here. I pray the Holy Ghost will help you liken these scriptures to you and your family. See 1 Nephi 1923. I, I leave it in if that's like in the actual text of the talk, but if it's just like a citation, like a footnote, then I take it out. And fill your hearts with the true spirit of Christmas. Our account begins in the land of Zarahemla a few years before the birth of the Savior. Samuel the Lamanite came among the people to preach repentance and prophecy and prophesy of Christ. Now, please try to imagine you were 10 years old in a member of the multitude listening to a prophet of God foretell future events. Okay, <clears throat> now this, okay, just look, this is so interesting, the, the numbers here. Samuel declared, behold, I give unto you a sign for five, five years more cometh, and behold, then cometh the Son of God to redeem all those who shall believe on his name. As time passed, the prophecies of the prophets, prophets began to be fulfilled more fully, for there began to be greater signs and greater miracles wrought among the people, which, by the way, I feel like that's happening right now as we speak. I'm trying to keep track of it on my timeline. Okay, Elder Bender, please now imagine five years have passed, and you are now approximately 15 years old. So there was like a lot of big hype <clears throat> in uh, 2020, <coughs> excuse me, <clears throat> 2019, 2020, about the year 2020. And uh, a lot of it had to do with the 2017 eclipse. Some of it had to do with the Great Conjunction uh, on winter solstice, December 21st, 2020, right? And it doesn't seem like the second coming happened that year. But a lot of very, very important things did happen that year. And I have reason to believe that po possibly, just possibly, that the April 2020 General Conference was part of Adam on Diamond, which I know some people will balk at because they think that everybody from the entire church is literally, by some means, going to go to the Valley of Adam on Diamond and there's going to be, you know, stadium seating or we'll all have tents or I don't know what. And we're all going to be packed in uh, in order to be part of that conference in a small confined area. Or maybe that we'll go there through spiritual means or, you know, space won't be an issue, seating. I, I don't know. I don't know. But I tend to think that the Lord prefers to work through practical means most of the time. Um, and... I'm, I have another quote that's coming up by Sister Nelson, the, the one that everybody quotes all the time, where she talked about what if you, uh, what if you knew that there was something going on right now where the Savior is making appearances to, you know, different congregations of the church um, as part of his second coming. So, here's Elder Bednar speaking five years before 2020. Uh, in five years before the April 2020 General Conference, where we did the Hosanna Shout, New Church Symbol, New Proclamation, and many other things. The one that, that President Nelson said would be unforgettable, right? And I think that 
the reason why it'll be it'll be unforgettable it, it could be because of those things but maybe because that was one of the general membership sessions of Adam on Diamon. The reason why I think that uh, is twofold. One, okay, let's go back here, go back to my quotes, A through Z tab. I shared this uh, before a while ago, but there was an interesting hint dropped by Elder Jeffrey R. Holland. Uh, everyone prayers for him. His uh, wife recently passed away, and I'm sure that he's going through a very difficult time right now. I know that I would. But anyway, uh, in his talk called Prophets in the Land Again, October 2006 General Conference, he says this, As prophets have done in dispensations from Adam, Adam down to the present day, okay, as prophets have done in dispensations from Adam down to the present day, President Hinckley has figuratively gathered us in a kind of global equivalent of the Valley of Adam on Diamon, has loved us and taught us and bestowed upon us his blessing. There's not really a, a need to say that. And it, I couldn't see anywhere else in the talk where that really was relevant. It, it just seems like it's a bread, it's a breadcrumb. It's a hint that maybe, you know, maybe not for the entirety of, of Adam on Diamond, but we know it's going to be made up of different sessions. It's not just like one meeting. There's different sessions that general conference itself could be part of uh, that series of sessions. Another thing I wanted to read really quick was from Millennial Messiah. This is uh, chapter 47, the private and public appearances. Our Lord's many appearances. And by the way, Sister Nelson referenced this. Uh, in her talk, she she cited this. The second coming of the Son of Man consists not of one, but many appearances. Our blessed Lord will come, attended by all the hosts of heaven, and in all the glory of his Father's kingdom, not to one, but to many places. And you have to wonder if when that happens, are you going to be able to see them? Are you going to be able to see them with your spiritual eyes, for example, at the 2020 General Conference? Other times, probably and certainly when he comes to the jews and when he comes to the world but you have to wonder about an, an event like the 2020 the april 2020 general conference uh he will stand on one continent after another so not even just in the valley of adam on Diamond, or not just uh salt lake city at the conference center or in the Salt Lake temple or whatever he will stand on one continent after another, speak to one great assemblage after another, and work his will among succeeding groups of mortals. Allusions to, and some explanations concerning these various appearances are found in the ancient world. These, however, might well be what might well go unnoticed or remain without proper interpretation, if it were not for the clarifying views found in the in the latter day revelation. He gives an example from Psalms. Um, and a few other things. And then uh, he goes on after that, after this section, to talk about Adam on Diamond. This section of his talk is called He Cometh to Adam on Diamond. So that's why I, I think it's interesting that Elder Bednar, uh, five, years bef uh, five years before the April 2020 General Conference, makes this statement as though he's dropping his own hint that, you know, maybe five years from now is going to be an important year. And it certainly was. And I'm sure that they already had planned out uh, to some degree what was going to happen during that conference. And if that was part, if that was part of uh, Adam on Diamond, then it certainly is unforgettable. Right. Although we may not know it so much until after the fact at some point, if we once we fully realize the significance of what happened. They have done Hosanna shouts for other occasions like the centennial of the church. I, I did a whole video about it. I don't remember all the details at this moment. So the Hosanna shout that was done to commemorate to commemorate the 200 years since the first vision, it's not unprecedented, but that doesn't mean that it wasn't special. Because Hosanna shouts aren't done all too often uh, with just very few 
exceptions. Um, for example, like I said, at the centennial of the church, they also did it when uh, the conference center was dedicated. I, I think it was, I, I can't remember if it was like the, the dedication where they did it itself, but they did a Hosanna shout for that. So very few exceptions. And then most of the time, uh, whenever there's a temple that's dedicated. So it is rare that it happens. And the fact that we did it um, at that time and after Elder Bednar says this, I don't know. I think that something very special happened more than maybe what we know for sure at this point. Okay, continuing. um, Please now imagine five years have passed and you are now approximately 15 years old. You can recall clearly the prophecies of Samuel as you consider the present circumstances in which you live. But there were some who began to say that the time was past for the words to be fulfilled, which were spoken by Samuel the Lamanite. Then, indeed, the sign of Christ's birth foretold by Samuel was given in a climate of religious persecution, like what we're going through now. And at the tender age of approximately 15, you marveled, you marveled one evening as the sun went down, but there was no darkness. The day Jesus was born was a day of deliverance for the believers in the new world. Light is the sign of the Savior's birth, literally saved their lives. Amazing, amazing talk. Oh, and then the very next one. Okay. So this is, we're now in 2016. This is uh, Wendy Watson, the, the wife of President Nelson. And this was, this was during a worldwide devotional for young adults. And this was being broadcast from BYU, Hawaii. And you can find this on the church website. The link for it's right here. If you come to my spreadsheet, and uh, everyone is very familiar with this too. This is this is this was like quite the thing to say. She says, "So now a question as I conclude: What if you learned that the Savior had already returned to this earth? That he, as part of his second coming, had already met with some of his true followers in several marvelous large gatherings? Gatherings." about which the world, including CNN and the blogosphere, knew nothing. If you found out that the Savior was already on the earth, what would you desperately want to do today, and what would you be willing and ready to do tomorrow? Another really big hint, and by the way, just like a month after uh, Elder Bednar said what he did, giving another hint about the timing of when Christ would come. Um... You know, and even by this point, by 2015, who knows? Who knows if the the very initial uh, meetings had already taken place, possibly in Adamondayam in itself by that point, or maybe they were put on notice that uh, 2020 would be the first of the meetings. Maybe starting, may, maybe look at this. What if the April 2020 general conference was the first? And it was necessary to do the Hosanna shout because Hosanna means save now. It's like, hey, please come save us, you know, save now. And one of the greatest savings that's going to take place, aside from the atonement itself, when Christ came the first time, will be his second coming. When he saves uh, the world from this persecution and uh, all the horrible things that are happening. It's going to be a time of saving for those that are righteous. So, and maybe they knew that. Maybe they knew that the first call for help, the initial event to kick off uh, the second coming officially, as far as, you know, excluding, of course, the first vision and just like setting up the whole church, but like actually starting things off, maybe the starting of Adam and Yaman, Maybe they knew it was going to begin April 2020. I don't know. Now, the next one uh, is during that same devotional. Uh, after Sister Nelson spoke, it was uh, uh, at the time President Nelson, still president of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles. And uh, he gave a very explicit talk. Okay, he says, When I pray about you and ask the Lord how he feels about you, I feel something far different from what the researchers say. Spiritual impressions I've received about you lead me to believe that the term millennial may actually be perfect for you. 
but for a much different reason than the experts may, uh, may ever understand. A true millennial is a man or woman whom God trusted enough to send to earth during the most compelling dispensation in the history of this world. A true millennial is a man or woman who lives now to help prepare the people of this world for the second coming of Jesus Christ and his millennial reign. Make no mistake about it, you were born to be a true millennial. Why? Well, I think he's saying that uh, the vast majority of millennials, unless they die early, uh, before their time, are literally going to be living in uh, the millennium. Again, I have a playlist about all these different generational quotes. It's a, it's actually this playlist right here, quotes, rising generation. It's which it's there's also been other very explicit things that have been said that are that I have recorded there. I have a playlist called Rising Generation. If you're curious to know more, if you're like a baby boomer or older, and you're like, am I going to be included? I feel like if you're alive right now, there's probably a really good chance, um, including baby boomers. And I believe that based on what prophets and apostles have said openly. So go watch that playlist. Okay, the next one, uh, this is the April 2016 General Conference, uh, President Nelson, the price of priesthood power. He says, I urgently plea. With each of us who live up to that, okay, I urgently plea with each one of us to live up to our privileges as bearers of the priesthood. Oh, by the, by the way, this is the priesthood session. In a coming day, only those men who have taken their priesthood seriously by diligently seeking to be taught by the Lord himself will be able to bless, guide, protect, strengthen, and heal others. Only those men that have taken their priesthood seriously. Only a man who has paid the price for priesthood power will be able to bring miracles to those he loves and keep his marriage and family safe now and throughout eternity. And you guys, I feel like I've seen this in my own life as things have become crazier in the world. Um, I feel like I have, I have a testimony that that's, that's actually true. I've, I've seen miracles happening and uh, definitely have very good communication with Heavenly Father. I hope that you do too, that you really take prayer seriously, both men and women, obviously. Anyway, what is the price to develop such priesthood power? The, sa the Savior Senior Apostle Peter, the same Peter who, uh, with James and John, conferred the Melchizedek priesthood upon Joseph Smith and, all of, and Oliver Cowdery. And then he has an interesting footnote here. Uh, the Savior, Moses, and Elijah, sometimes referred to as Elias, initially gave the keys to Peter, James, and John on the mount when Jesus was transfigured before them. So I don't know. It's just interesting that it bring, he brings up transfiguration, which we know that translation is like transfiguration, but of a more permanent nature. So I don't know if that's maybe a little hint. But anyway... Declared qualities we should seek to be partakers of the divine nature. He named faith, virtue, knowledge, temperance, patience, godliness, brotherly kindness, charity, and diligence. And don't forget humility. So I ask, how would our family members, friends, and co-workers say you and I are doing in developing these and other spiritual gifts? The more the, those attributes are developed, the greater will be our priesthood power. So, I don't know. Maybe think about yourself. If you're not so good at these things, maybe your priesthood power isn't as strong as it should be. Uh, this very much reminds me of talk, when we were talking about the temple garment, because we read a quote saying that uh, the degree to which it protects you um, corresponds with your uh, righteousness in your... Um, obedience essentially it, it's almost like it, it, it acts as like an amplifier you know you still get tempted but the more serious you are about life the more serious you are about the gospel the more that you work to become the person that the lord wants you to be it's like the garment acts as like an amplifier 
Whereas if you didn't have that amplifier, you pro- you could probably still do it, but it'd be it'd be harder, and you wouldn't have have as much power. And uh, you know, I don't know if he's like saying this in the in reference to the temple garment uh, that might be included, or just in general. I don't know, but your power it seems can be amplified. You know, like he says here, the greater will be our priesthood power. Okay, how else can we how else can we increase our power in the priesthood? We need to pray from our hearts. Polite recitations of past and upcoming events, punctuated with some request for blessings, cannot constitute the kind of communication with God that brings enduring power. Are you willing to pray to know how to pray for more power? The Lord will teach you. So, that's interesting. Are you willing to pray to know how to pray for more more power? I feel like I've heard that repeated a couple times. In fact, President Nelson, as president of the church, just within the last couple years, I think he said something like, we need to stop being so selfish with our prayers where we're just like asking for things for ourselves. I'm not going to look that up right now, but maybe that rings a bell. Do you remember him saying that? Uh, and if any if anybody wants to, feel free to put that quote in the comments uh, for others to look at. So, yeah, you know, I, I've I think I think it's important to like really ask him to help you uh, do your best. You know, I've had times where I've been like, like I want to become become exalted so much. That's that's you know, where my treasure is. I'm sure it is with, well, hopefully most of you um, have that be your prize. And, you know, I prayed and maybe you have too. It's like, Heavenly Father, just help me do whatever it takes. I'm willing to go through whatever trial. Just please bless me with whatever it takes to straighten me out um, and help me in any way possible to do that. You understand he's not going to like override your agency. But I think that when you pray for help uh, and only when you ask for that help, will you receive that help? You know, and and not just, you know, in, the, in this case, you're talking about your own exaltation. But uh, for other things, too, just please let me know whatever it is I need to do to be part of your plan. Sorry, thy plan right now during the last days? What what should I do to help people be prepared for the second coming? What should I do to help my ward? You know, tell me what to do and please help me with my weaknesses or help me have the strength to um, whatever, you know, talk to people, please. I, I have a hard time. You know, I, I have like this whole contact contacts list of people that I could send the Book of Mormon to makes me nervous. Please help. Help. So I think that those are maybe some examples. And uh, feel free to put down uh, your advice in the comments. But maybe we should pray a little bit uh, with more power instead of just like, thank you for this. Thank you for that. Please bless this. Please bless that. And have an actual real conversation and talk about serious things. And talk about um, making changes inside of yourself. Okay. All right. Continuing. Are you willing to search the scriptures and feast on the words of Christ? So this is like the the next one. To study earnestly in order to have more power. If you want to see your, your wife's heart melt, let her find you on the internet studying the doctrine of Christ or reading your scriptures. Yep. And you guys, I would recommend, if you're not already doing so, whatever method works best for you, do do something like what I'm doing where, you know, you save quotes, you save scriptures. We're not robots and we're not computers. You can't, I mean, you can, you can memorize things and I think it's good to memorize scriptures and stuff like that, but there are limitations and you can't possibly remember every single thing, every single, single gem you've come across so 
record it somewhere, uh, systematize it, systematize it. Yeah. So you can easily find it and refer back to it. You know, feel free to copy my entire thing. Do, do whatever you want. But I think it's a good idea to, uh, especially now that we have computers. I mean, imagine back in like uh, the 80s or 70s or before where you'd have to like write things down. So we have really powerful tools right now. Okay. Are you willing to worship in the temple regularly? The Lord loves to do his own teaching in his house. That's interesting. His own teaching. I'm going to highlight that. Uh, imagine how pleased he would be if you asked him to teach you about priesthood keys, authority, and power as you experience the ordinances of the Melchizedek priesthood in the Holy Temple. I can't say that I've, I've asked about that, so maybe next time I go, I will. Let's see, asked him to teach you about priesthood keys, authority, and power in the ordinances of the milk. In the, well, I have prayed to like understand things there, but not specifically keys, authority, and power. Imagine the increase in priesthood power that could be yours. Uh, are you willing to follow President Thomas S. Monson's example of serving others? For decades, he has taken the long way home. Uh, following promptings of the Spirit to arrive on someone's doorstep and then hear words such as, how did you know it was the anniversary of our daughter's death? Or uh, how did you know it was my birthday? And if you want to, if you want more priesthood power, you will cherish and care for your wife, embracing both her and her counsel. Yeah. Now, later in the talk, toward the end, he says, My dear brethren, we have been given a sacred trust, the authority of God to bless others. Uh, may each one of us rise up as the man of God, the man God for, da for, for the, blah, 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 blah. may each of us, <laughs> may each one of us rise up as the man God foreordained us to be ready to bear the priesthood of God bravely, eager to pay whatever price is required. I should highlight that eager to pay whatever price is required to increase, uh, Increase his power in the priesthood. And that's really that's a really hard question that we have to ask ourselves. Are we willing to pay whatever price to have charity, to live righteously, to avoid temptations? Uh, another thing that President Nelson recently said was, now is the time to, and I'm paraphrasing, now is the time to... Um, like put away our favorite sins or something like that. And, th and that's kind of uncomfortable because <laughs> I know that we all do it. We all have some secret favorite sin. Um, are you willing to pay the price to give that thing up or those things? Maybe there's more, maybe you have a whole collection of favorite sins. I don't know. You know, even just like a small thing like driving the speed limit. Um, I, I don't know why it's so prevalent. And I, I myself have done it. You know, in the United States, uh, I don't know about other countries. I'm sure human behavior is the same everywhere. But in the U.S., uh, the speed limit is according to miles per hour. And um, it's common practice to at least drive, you know, five miles above the speed limit. And like, that's okay because, well, it's not like di driving dangerously and highway, the highway patrol or, or city cops, I guess, if you're driving in the city, they're not going to pull you over for just five, five miles an hour or the speed limit. But that's not right. You guys, that is not right. There's a speed limit. It's the limit. It's the law. And it's in our Articles of Faith and elsewhere that we obey the laws of the land. Does it really get you there that much quicker by going five miles over the speed limit? I don't think so. <laughs> I watched a, a Mythbusters one time. It wasn't talking about driving over the speed limit, but it was. they did like a little experiment about 
the type of people that keep switching lanes so that, you know, they can get around traffic and the time difference in which they arrived at their location was like minuscule. <laughs> and you know what I do? I just put on, um, I just put on cruise control. Like how hard is that? Like by, by this point, probably most vehicles have cruise control. Um, unless yours is like older, but how hard is it just to put, to put on cruise control? And then you don't even have to like think about, Oh gosh, I accidentally went too quick. Like I'm going seven miles over the speed limit. It's just, and I've noticed that when I made that change, uh, and I did this, uh, I don't know, a couple years ago when I started just like, okay, I'm not going to do five miles over the speed limit anymore. I just used cruise control and it just, it makes absolutely no difference to me as far as like, getting to places on time. I don't feel like I'm like getting there. Oh my gosh. So late. I should have gone five miles over the speed limit. It, just, it takes just a little bit of time to make that adjustment, just like all habits. But once it becomes habit, it's just right. Normal life, you know? So is that one of your, uh, favorite little sins? There's probably people that have more serious ones, especially guys that are more prone to, um, you know, bad things on the internet or other things, you know, women can have that too, but I think women maybe have their own different, I don't, I don't know. And we don't need to list our favorite sins <laughs> in the comments, but maybe now is the time to like really think about putting that away and, and being willing to pay whatever price. And then, but not just that, but asking Holy Father to help you pay that price. Uh, and to strengthen you, you know. All right. So anyway, um, with that power, uh, we can help prepare the world for the second coming of our Savior, Jesus Christ. So really important for us to increase our priesthood power as men. And then women should also try to increase their spirituality and their callings and th the things that they do that are uniquely female. Okay. The next one, this is Bonnie L. Oscarson rise up in strength in strength sisters in Zion. Uh, she, she was young women, general president. And she says, I testify that the Lord has blessed us as women to live in these perilous times with all of the power gifts and strength that are needed in order to prepare the world for the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. I pray that we may all see our true potential and rise up to become the women of faith and courage our Father in Heaven needs us to be. All right, and here's the last one. Um, this is Neil L. Anderson, Elder Neil L. Anderson, a witness of God, uh, the October 2016 General Conference. He says, the gathering of Israel is a miracle. Now, this is interesting because, you know, President Nelson, he was not yet president of the church. This was two years before. And, you know, there's still this verbiage, the gathering of Israel, and equating it to the second coming. He says, it is like an enormous puzzle whose pieces will be set in place prior to the glorious events of the second coming. Just as we might be perplexed with a mountain of puzzle pieces, the early saints must have seen the commission to take the restored gospel to all the world as nearly impossible task, but they began one person, one puzzle piece at a time, finding the straight edges, working to rightly frame this divine work. Little by little, the stone cut without hands began to roll forth from hundreds to thousands to, th to tens of thousands, and now millions of covenant Latter-day Saints across every nation are connecting the puzzle pieces of this marvelous work in wonder. Each of us is a piece of the puzzle and each of us helps to set in place other essential pieces. Uh, you are important to get this great cause. Wait, what you are important. Sorry. <laughs> you are important to this great cause. Our view ahead is now clear. We can see the miracle continuing in the Lord's hand guiding as we completely, as we complete the gaps that remain. Then uh, the great Jehovah will say the work is done and he will return in majesty and glory. 
President Thomas S. Monson has said, quote, now is the time for members and missionaries to come together, to work together, to bring souls unto him. He will assist us in our labors if we will act in faith to fulfill his work, end quote. The divinely appointed responsibility that once rested primarily upon the soldier, the soldier, the shoulders of full-time missionaries now rests upon us all. We all want, we all want to share the restored gospel and gratefully thousands are baptized each week. But even with this wonderful blessing, our concern for our brothers and sisters and our desire to please God bring a compelling urgency to share and strengthen the kingdom of God across the world. So, Gathering scattered Israel in preparation for the second coming. And President Nelson, I don't need to tell you, has been stressing that strongly ever since he became president of the church. Uh, it's been kind of a big deal. All right. Now, uh, let's go back to 2015. Uh, and this time it's Elder Anderson again in a talk called Thy Kingdom Come. So I have this pulled up in the Scripture Citation Index. <coughs> Excuse me. And uh, he says some pretty, pretty interesting things here. Okay, that's going to be the best way to do this. Arrow keys, yeah, okay. Okay, he says, As we were singing, I was deeply moved with the thought that at this very moment, hundreds of thousands, perhaps millions of believing saints in more than 150 countries, amazingly, in uh, 75 different languages, together, were raising our voices to God, singing, Come, O thou King of Kings, we've waited long for thee, with healing in thy wings, to set thy people free. Um. <clears throat> I don't know if this is just like the next section of his talk. Oh, come thou king of kings. Now there's a footnote, and this is really interesting what he says in the footnote. Uh, we've talked a number of times about the hymns that are selected for a general conference. And I haven't really understood like exactly how that process works. Who chooses it? Is it one of the general authorities? the apostles, the prophet, or is it is it just up to the uh, the people that do the music? Well, look at this. Okay. So remember, this is April uh, 2019. The April General Conference. April. He says, on Tuesday, March 31st, so the day before uh, April. In fact, let, let me just look up really quick. You're not going to be able to see this. I'm looking on my computer. Okay, go back to 2015, April. So the the 31st was Tuesday, like he said. And then one, two, three, four days later was General Conference. Four and five days later. Okay. So less than a week. On Tuesday, March 31st, 2015, the First Presidency's office sent me an email explaining that I would speak on Sunday afternoon uh, at, uh, okay, April 5th. Oh, he puts the date there. Immediately following the congregational hymn, Come, O Thou King of Kings. The text of this great restoration hymn, written by Parley P. Pratt, is a humble plea to the Savior to return to the earth. It embodied the message of my conference talk, perhaps more powerfully than any other hymn we sing. I was deeply moved by the significance of believing saints everywhere joining together on Easter Sunday, raising our voices to God, and in unison singing, Come, O thou King of Kings, we've waited long for thee. Realizing that I personally had no input on the music selection for General Conference, I wondered if those those responsible for the music had read my conference talk entitled Thy Kingdom Come and then chose this hymn and then chosen this hymn about the second coming of the Savior. I later learned that the Tabernacle Choir directors had recommended the hymn to the, to the First Presidency in early March, weeks prior to my talk being sent to the First Presidency for translation. The last time 
that Come O Thou King of Kings was sung was a congregational hymn in general conference or as a as a congregational hymn in general conference was October 2002. Uh, we each tried to do our part, but he is the grand architect. So I get I guess maybe the standard is that uh, those doing the music submit the hymns to the first presidency uh, for approval. I don't know if sometimes the first presidency requests certain hymns, because maybe that's a possibility too. But at least in this story, uh, they chose a hymn that hadn't been sung in general conference since 2002. And it just so happened to come at, at a time when it went along perfectly with his talk. <laughs> so they weren't like, okay, uh, this is going to be perfect. Let's do this hymn with this talk because they match. No, the Lord did that. That is just crazy. And why would the Lord do that? I, I think to really impress upon our minds and like to really impress upon our spirits through the spirit that this really is happening and to really pay attention. Okay, so he continues uh, in his talk. We are a very large worldwide family of believers, disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ. We have taken upon, a, upon us in each week, sorry, we have taken his name upon us and each week as we partake of the sacrament, we pledge that we will remember him and keep his commandments. We are far from perfect, but we are not casual in our faith. We believe in him, we worship him, we follow him, we deeply love him. His cause is the greatest cause in all the world. We live, brothers and sisters, in the days preceding the Lord's second coming, a time long ante anticipated by believers through the ages. We live in the days of wars and rumors of wars, days of natural disasters, days when the world is pulled by confusion and commotion. But we also live in the glorious time of the restoration when the gospel is being taken to all the world, a time when the Lord has promised that he will raise up a pure people. Again, this goes along with what we've read several times before uh, recently, that in a continual theme that there needs to be a people ready to receive the Lord when he comes. And that's like a big concern, it seems, of the church. All right, so... A time when the Lord has promised that he will raise up a pure people and arm them with righteousness and with the power of God. That's something that's been repeated many times. Right, Being clothed, armed with righteousness and the power of God. We rejoice in these days and pray that we will be able to courageously face our struggles and uncertainties. The difficulties of some are more severe than those of others, but no one is immune. Elder Neil A. Maxwell once told, once said to me, quote, if everything is going perfectly for you right now, just wait. <laughs> okay, skipping down. Three beautiful examples of the Lord's hand in establishing his kingdom are the temples announced today by President Monson. Only a few decades ago, who could have imagined temples in Haiti, Thailand, and the Ivory Coast? <sighs> Yeah, not me. Um, the location of a temple is not a convenient uh, geographical decision. It comes by revelation from the Lord to his prophet, signifying a great work to be done and acknowledging the righteousness of the saints who will treasure and care for his house through, the, through generations. Okay, in the footnote, he says, In the fall of 2001, while living in Brazil, I enthusiastically shared with President James E. Faust of the First Presidency many impressive facts about the saints living in the city of uh, Curitiba, hoping that, or hoping he would pass the, informa the information along to President Gordon B. Hinckley. President Faust stopped me mid-sentence. Neil, he said, we don't lobby the president. The decision where to build the temple is between the Lord and his prophet. The Curitiba Brazil Temple was dedicated in 2008, so it did it did end up being there. Okay, that's the end of the footnote. Then he says, "My wife Kathy and I visited Haiti just two years ago, high on the mountain overlooking Port-au-Prince. Port, is it Port-au-Prince? Port-au-Prince. 
Uh, we join with Haitian saints in commemorating the dedication of the country by Elder Thomas S. Monson only 30 years earlier. None of us will ever forget the devastating uh, Haitian earthquake of 2010. No, we won't. Uh, I have, you know what? Let me pull up my earthquake tracker. Disasters, let's see, die-offs, hurricanes, earthquakes. here we go, earthquakes. Uh, you see this here? Let me zoom in a little bit. So I have this color-coded by, uh, in columns D and E, by death toll. So D is like total death toll between all earthquakes that year, and then E is uh, just the death toll of the deadliest earthquake in that particular year. And you can see that the years 2004 and 2010 really stand out, uh, more so than any other year. This only goes back to 1985. Uh, that's because that's how far back the Wikipedia articles go, and that's where I get these numbers. But, because uh, I don't need to be exactly precise, I just need a general idea. But you can see that um, the the worst year, as far as far as death tolls go, was 2004. But 2010 was uh, just barely underneath that. Um, now the thing now the thing about 2004 is that that was as the result as the result of not only an earthquake but also a tsunami that ensued. Whereas, as far as I know, uh, the Haitian earthquake was purely because of the earthquake. Hold on, I'm gonna find out for sure. 2010 Haiti tsunami. I just saw something tsunami so it says um, a magnitude 8.0 earthquake struck the Dominican Republic and shook Haiti on the 4th of August 19, 1946 okay no uh, the Pacific Tsunami Warning Center issued a tsunami warning immediately after the initial quake but quickly canceled it yeah, so uh, everybody here, it was not, they did not die as a result of a tsunami. It was just pure earthquake. So I think you could say that that particular earthquake was the most deadly uh, probably ever. I wonder if there's like anything here. Most record. I don't know. I'm not going to do the research here. Anyway. Okay, so let's get back to the talk. So this is a significant event that he's referring to here. This is not just like some, you know, thing that happens in some other land. And yeah, earthquakes happen all the time. No, this one stands, it's far and away, maybe the worst earthquake ever in terms of death toll. Okay, none of us will ever forget the devastating Haitian earthquake of 2010, uh, with faithful members and a courageous band of missionaries made up almost exclusively of Haitians. The church in the, the church in this island nation has continued to grow and strengthen. It lifts my faith to visualize these righteous saints of God, of God, clothed in white, having the power of the holy priesthood to direct and perform the sacred ordinances of the Lord's house. Who could imagine a house of the Lord? in the beautiful city of Bangkok. Not me. I was surprised when it was announced. Christians are only 1% of this principally Buddhist country. As in Haiti, we also found in Bangkok that the Lord has gathered the elect of the earth. While there are a few, while, while there a few months ago, we met Sathit in Jutamas Kaiva Vidana and their devoted children. Sathit joined the church when he was 17 and served a mission in his native land. Later, he met Jude Hamas at the Institute, and they were sealed in the Manila Philippines Temple. In, in 1993, the Kaiv... Okay, I'm going to actually try to... Kaiv were hit by a truck whose driver had fallen asleep, and Sathit was paralyzed from his chest down. 
Their faith never wavered. Sahi is an admired teacher in the International School of Bangkok. He serves as the stake president of the Thailand Bangkok North Stake. We see God's miracles in his wondrous work and in our own personal lives. The miracle of the church in the Ivory Coast cannot be told without the names of two couples, Felipe and Annalise Hassard. And Lu okay, this, this video is going a little bit long. Um, I'm going to skip just a little bit. Can you see how the hand of God, can you see the hand of God moving his work forward? Can you see the hand of God in the lives of the missionaries in Haiti or the Kaviva Tatanas in Thailand? Can you see the hand of God in the lives of the Assards, the Afos? Can you, <laughs> shouldn't be laughing. Can you see the hand of God in your own life? Um... All right, I'm going to move on. Remember the young man who carried out the prophet, who cried out to the prophet Elisha um, as they were surrounded by enemies? Alas, what shall we do? Elisha answered, Fear not, for they that be with us are more than they that be with them. Then Elisha prayed, Lord, open his eyes that he may see. And the Lord did open the eyes of the young man, and he did see that the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire. This is important because there's a lot of people that are afraid right now, uh, unfortunately, in the church. Um, you know, not saying that they don't have testimonies, but I, I guess maybe part of their testimony needs to be worked on when it comes to the second coming. And... Uh, that the Lord is going to come off conquer, basically, that he's going to uh, be victorious in that the righteous will be preserved. Not to say that you're not going to escape all the judgments or that bad things won't happen to you or your area, but for the most part, the righteous are going to be preserved. And even though it seems really daunting that all of society, all of entertainment, all of politics seem to be skewed one way, um, and it may seem like we're surrounded and it's just, you know, impossible to fight against this tide of wickedness. This is the reality that those that are for us are more than they, them that are against us. Uh, not only in numbers, you know, but in power. Okay, later. Our faith grows as we anticipate the glorious day of the Savior's return to the earth. The thought of his coming stirs my soul. It'll be breathtaking. The scope and grandeur, the vastness and magnificence will exceed anything mortal eyes have ever seen or experienced. And by the way, you know, President Nelson said that in coming days, we will see the greatest manifestations of the Savior's power the world has ever seen. And maybe he's referencing specifically this, the, the things associated with the second coming itself. Anyway, in that day, he will not come wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger, but he will appear in the clouds of heaven, clothed with power and great glory with all the holy angels. We will hear the voice of the archangel and the trump of God. The sun and the moon will be transformed and the stars will be hurled from their places. You and I, or those who follow us, uh, the saints from every quarter of the earth, shall be quickened and caught up to meet him. And those who have died in righteousness, they too will be caught up to meet him in the midst of heaven. So again, the the translation or the quickening event, it's the same thing, happens at the same time as the resurrection, the, the initial resurrection. Then, a seemingly impossible experience. All flesh, the Lord says, shall see me together. How will it happen? We do not know, but I testify it will happen exactly as prophesied. We will kneel in reverence, and the Lord shall utter his voice, and all the ends of the earth shall hear it. It shall be as the voice of many waters, and as the voice of a great thunder. Then the Lord, the Savior, shall stand in the midst of his people. There will be unforgettable reunions with the angels of heaven and the saints upon the earth. But most important, and I can only assume... Uh, we know that part of that is um, 
the city of Enoch. In fact, I think that's what he, he cites right here. Moses 7, 63. And the Lord said unto Enoch, Then shalt thou and all thy city meet them there, and they will and, the, and we will receive them into our bosom, and they shall see us, and we will fall upon their necks, and they shall fall upon our necks, and we will kiss each other. Um, okay, so that's what he's referencing. But most important, as I, Isaiah declares, all the ends of the earth shall see the salvation of our God, and he shall reign over all flesh. In that day, the skeptics will be silent for every ear shall hear and every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, the Savior, and the Redeemer of the world. Today is Easter. We rejoice with Christians all over the world in his glorious resurrection and in our own promised resurrection. May we prepare for his coming by... Now look at this. And is this something that you do? Well, I think we do it together as we do this YouTube channel and as you watch other YouTube channels. Um, hopefully you're doing this yourself by rehearsing these glorious events over and over in our own minds and with those we love and may his prayer be our prayer thy kingdom come thy will be done in, in earth as it is in heaven i testify that he lives come come O thou king of kings so um rehearse this in your mind you know, it's kind of hard because we don't have all the nitty gritty details, but we all, we have at least the important events and uh, we don't know exactly what it's going to look like, but we have a general idea. And uh, yeah, so if you're of the opinion or if you come across people that are of the opinion that you shouldn't think about the second coming, um, you should only focus on the here and now. Um, just, you know, let the Lord take care of that. It'll happen when it happens. No, that's not, that's not what we're counseled to do. We're supposed to watch for the signs. It says that over and over and over again in the scriptures. In here, uh, Elder Anderson is telling us that we should rehearse these things in our minds. Okay, well, uh, that's going to be it for this one. I thought that this was pretty good. I love reviewing these things, and uh, there's a lot of things to think about here. But we have covered 2015, 2016. At some point, I'm going to add more to these years, and then I'll also include 2017. And I don't know, I'm, I'm going to make this as big as, as possible, like go all the, as far back as possible and uh, stay up to date with it. So the next one that we'll do will be the year 2020, uh, a very significant year, as we as we talked about earlier. Um, feel free to send me anything that you have, any quotes that I can add on to here. Um, I may already have it, so uh, if you want to save yourself a little bit of work, you can access my spreadsheet, click on the link below for my spreadsheet, come to the tab that's called quotes second coming and then you can check it and um, if I don't have it uh, send it to me or just send it to me anyway you don't have to check this just send it anyway but yeah all right all right that's gonna be it for this one if you haven't already please make sure to subscribe like this video if you liked it leave your thoughts and opinions down in the comments below also make sure to share it and I'll talk to you guys later